many of y'all would agree that the old cartoons were the best? Right, a lot of hands going up in this one. The Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies and all that. With elections going on, one of my favorite ones is Ballot Box Bunny. Anybody seen that one, Ballot Box Bunny? You're going to see it now. Um, with Yosemite Sam running for mayor, of course, he hates rabbits, especially that one called Bugs Bunny. And his platform is to rid this country of every last rabbit. And of course, Bugs Bunny hears that and he decides to run for mayor as well. And both try to win the townspeople over, but you know how that's going to go. And in the end, of course, Bugs Bunny sort of wins. I don't know if y'all want to keep watching that, but we're going to have to stop, stop it now. <laughs> Election season being upon us, you know, it seems just as crazy and comical when you see people do what they do. I, I, I know the candidates I'm going to support, those who support biblical values, but I am glad when Wednesday comes and we don't have to see those ads anymore. Amen to that? Amen. I'm done with, with that. That just kind of is annoying. But anyways, uh, sometimes election season can seem that way, but in today's message we're going to learn the importance of election, the importance of voting biblical values. Last week, as Ryan mentioned in our first message in this series called Tyranny, uh, we saw how every period in history has nimrods, even our own right now. And their desire is to concentrate power and to rule the world. They want to control the lives of every single person. I mean, that's pretty much how it goes. Uh, this message will help us see the American idea and how this nation was created to stand against such nimrods. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's find 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 4. And the main point is this. Unlike most governments in history, America was founded with the understanding that all people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This is not something you find in other nations. America was founded with the understanding that all people are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Denying those rights goes against the dignity of people who were created in the image of God. And unless we return to our Judeo-Christian foundation, we are at a great risk of losing those freedoms. It is vital. I know you hear people say that. I know you hear me say that. But that is the foundation of our freedoms. And of course, in America, we do need revival. 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now the passage we just read, 1 Samuel 8, 4, marks a very important period in the history of God's people. It falls somewhere about 1000 B.C. They've been in the land for several hundred years, but the form of government they have looks something like this. There is God and then there are people. God is their king. God rules his people. And how does he do that? For those 700 years, the people had a sense of a tribal confederacy. Remember the different tribes of Israel settled in different parts of Israel? It was a confederacy which was built around the law of God built around the priesthood, built around the tabernacle, and they worked this way, and somehow God was the king, and he ruled them. But unfortunately, people did not always listen to God. In fact, there was a set pattern in their sins. It began with people disobeying God. We know what the law says. We know what the priest is saying. We know what we hear at the tabernacle, but we're going to do whatever we want to do and worship false gods. And they would disobey God, and God would send a foreign power against them who would oppress them. And when this oppression would happen, they would cry out to God and say, God, help us, deliver us. And God would raise what's known as, we call them judges. 
and the judges would rise up and they would fight for the people and free the people. And they would go right back sinning. This was the pattern in those several hundred years. And judges like Gideon and Deborah and Barak and Samson and these people, some of them were wonderful, but some of them were not the paragon of righteousness. I mean, think about Samson. What kind of a person was he? Uh, not, not a person that you would say to your children, well, be like Samson. I mean, he had some horrible habits. Uh, he did some horrible things. So the judges were limited. They could not unite the people. They could not help the people. <clears throat> they did what they had to do. It was a very turbulent time in history. In fact, four times in the book of Judges, you find this statement. In those days, there was no king. And then twice it says, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was like the old wild west on steroids. People did what they wanted to do and nobody cared because there was no king. And so the people began to ask for a king. Now often you hear messages and Bible studies about how when they asked for a king, they really disappointed God and God was so angry with them because he is their king and, and he wants to rule them, but people were trying to go against God. That's not true. Giving his people a king was always part of God's plan. In fact, you have your Bibles open to 1 Samuel 8. Keep your hand there, but turn it over to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Because God had already promised them several times that he was going to give them a king. Listen to chapter 17 verse 14. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Verse 4, 15. This is Deuteronomy 17, 15. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. This was not against God's plan. This was part of God's plan that when you get into the land, you settle down you need to have a king. Not so that you can be like the other nations, but because you need a king who will lead you in my ways. And what will this king be like? Let's keep reading in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 15. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. It means he has to be one of you. Verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. What do we know about kings and queens? Even to this day in Europe, where we have automobiles and cars and all kinds of modern technology, they still have a stable. With all the pageantry, they still have horses and, and soldiers on horses. I mean, it's something about kings and horses. But God had told them, this king shall not multiply horses and neither shall he cause you to return to Egypt for the Lord has said you shall not return that way again. Make sure your king doesn't lead you back into slavery. I hope this morning as I'm preaching to you, I hope you're applying it to where we are in America today. We should never have representatives that lead us back into slavery, that lead us to bow to other nations. That should never happen. Albeit this is given to Israel, I hope you will apply it to us where we are. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Up until recent times, Kings had many wives. They had many gold and silver in their treasury. They, whatever they stole or traded or whatever, they had a massive treasure chest. But the king that God wants you to have should not have these things. But wait, something more. Verse 18. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom 
that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. It means it's not enough just to have a copy of the Old Testament, the Bible, in the tabernacle or in the temple. He needs to have his own copy. And what is he going to do with his own copy? Lock it up in a chest? Oh no. Listen to verse 19. And it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. I hope this helps you understand. Having a king was not against God's plan for his people. But the king should be one who would choose to follow God, refuse to lead the people into slavery, refuse to multiply wives and have gold and silver and all these things and rise above his brethren. He should be working for the people. He should be representing God to his people. You know, when the people of Israel asked for a king, that's not what they wanted. They said, give us a king so we can be like everybody else. They looked towards the Egyptians. They looked to the Assyrians. They looked to whoever, and they said, we want to be like these guys. Look how awesome their pageantry is. Look how proud they are of their king. Look how the king marches in battle. Look how many wives he has. Look how much gold and silver, how many horses. We want to be just like them. Now Samuel tried to caution them. He said, you, you want the king, but you want it from the right, wrong reasons. And he told them in 1 Samuel chapter 8, turn your Bibles back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm not going to read the whole passage for time's sake. But listen to verse 11. 1 Samuel 8, 11. He says, look, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots, and he will make them run before his chariots. What happens if you run before a chariot? What's going to happen? The chariot is going to trample over you. The king that you guys want because you want to be like all these other people, he's going to kill your children, your sons. But not enough. Here, here's more. Verse 12, he will appoint captains over his thousands and, and captains over his fifties. I mean, he's going to organize this army and he's going to uh, put some of them to plow his ground and reap his harvest and make weapons for him. Uh, he's going to take your daughters. Listen to verse 13, to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. You want your daughters to go and marry and have children and grandchildren? Forget that. He's going to make... Your daughters serve him. Hey, that's not enough. Listen, it gets worse. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. Uh, he, it, wait, it's, it's even worse because he will take it, verse 17, for time's sake, he will take a tenth of uh, your sheep. He will give it to his own servants. And so you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Do you really want a king? Because you want to be like everybody else. You know what their response was? Listen to 1 Samuel 8, 19. They said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. Now let me pause there for a moment. We're going to come back to the kings. We're going to come back to America and what it means and tyranny and all that for a moment. Let's just talk about personal lives. You know, sometimes people have a way of putting their foot down as to what they want. I really, really, really want this. Why do I really, really want, want this? Because I want to be like everybody else. I, I, I look at the Facebook post and I see what they have. I want them. I, I want their life. I want this. So God, give me this. God says, no, I'm not going to give you that. I want you to trust me. 
No, 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 God, I really, really, really want this, and I really want this. Sometimes it has to do with relationship. I really want this relationship, God. I don't care what you think. I, I'll fix her later. I'll fix him later. I just want this now. God, I really want this job. I really want this wealth. I really want th this lifestyle. And God says, no, I'm not going to give it to you. Why? Because I love you too much to give that to you. You know what some people do? They put their foot down and say, I am going to have this God with or without you. Open your ears this morning. You made the effort to come here. Don't fall asleep. Sometimes God gives it to us. You know what God said to Samuel when Samuel said, God, I don't know what to say. They want a king so they can be like everybody else. God said, listen to them, give it to them. The worst thing that can happen to you is for God to give you that relationship, that job, that lifestyle, let you have it, and you will wish in a thousand lifetimes that you did not ask for those things. But now you can't change it. You're stuck. I have met way too many people who said, I want it, and God, I know what you're saying, but I just want it. Now, we may not say it that way, but we think that way. Here's the sad reality. God even gives it to us and said, go ahead. That's what you want? I'll give it to you. Now you're miserable the rest of your life, and you wish you could turn back time, but you can't. So if God keeps closing certain doors, please, I beg you, don't force them open. Trust the mercy of God in your life. And if, here's the key. You know why God was against this? Not because he didn't want them to have a king. It's because they wanted to be like everybody else. It is the bane of human existence that I want to be like my neighbors or some family member or somebody at work. I want to have their lifestyle. I don't know what reasons you came this morning, but I hope some of you have heard that. But let's keep going back to the message. God gave them the kings. Now began a period in the history of Israel where there were kings. The time of the judges had come to an end. Now they had kings. And the first king was who? Saul. Well, what a great king. Well, how did Samuel find him, by the way? He was looking for his father's donkeys. Not even his own, but his father's donkey. How hard is it to find donkeys? I mean, you can hear them braying a mile away. But he could not find them for his life depended on it. And he was out. You know what God is doing? It's kind of a sense of humor. You want a king? I'm going to give you a king who could not even find his father's donkeys. You know, in the English, there's another word for donkey. I'm not going to use that. <laughs> that even though English wasn't there back then. That's what God was saying to them in a sense. This is who you are, and that's the kind of king you deserve. And from day one, Saul made some of the worst mistakes you can imagine as a king. And even Samuel said, I can't work with you. I'm going home. You know what people think? Oh, David. David was God's choice. Are you serious? Do you really think David was God's choice? No. God allowed David to come to the throne. And David was a wonderful king, obedient to the Lord. So wrote Psalm 23 that we just sang. Was a man after God's own heart. But you really believe that this was God's choice, King David? What did David do? He saw another man's wife. And he did not stop for a second to consider that, but he took her. He took her as a king takes somebody and had an adulterous relationship with her and had her husband murdered. You think that's God's choice? No. What a horrible thing. This is the world now they have to endure and live with. And then who follows next? Who is uh, David's son? Solomon. Now here something else begins to happen because Solomon starts out really well. He is, you know, the praise and say, God, give me wisdom to lead your people. God gives him wisdom and riches and honor. But then what does Samuel, Saul do? Uh, Solomon does. He takes how many wives and, children, and concubines? 700 
wives and 300 concubines, 1,000 1, in total. And then he built high places to these false idols everywhere. I hope you're understanding what's happening over here because this is what God warned them. No, you need a king that I will send you. No, 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 we want to be like everybody else. Okay, now you got it. And God punished Solomon and he split that kingdom into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And at times there were good kings like Uzziah, Hezekiah, Josiah, but most of them had a God complex. You, you see this right here? It became like this. Well, there is God. It's not that kings are under him. They're almost equal to God. Just like the nations around them, they became equal to God. So at first it was God appoints the king to rule his people. But in time it became God is king and king is God. Just like the nations around them. Remember, that's what they wanted. Amen. They wanted to be like everybody else. Well, now they got it. And so Bill Federer in his helpful book talks about this. Who is the king in America? He gives a list of kings throughout history. And I don't have time to list all of them. Like the King Gilgamesh of Uruk. He considered himself to be a demigod. Demigod means part human, part God. The Babylonian, the Assyrian kings were the king priests. The Egyptian pharaohs were the son of the god Osiris. When you go inside the tombs of the pharaohs, what you see is, okay, here's a pharaoh, here's his name, here's his family, but then whose son is he really? Not his earthly father. His father is uh, god Osiris. Demigods. The Tyre kings were building a bridge between the temporal and the celestial world. The Persian kings had a special relationship with the divine. The South Asian kings were agents of God. The Chinese emperor had a mandate from heaven to rule all these people. The Roman emperors, they even deified their Caesars as Augustus. You know what August means? Divine. You see how quickly it went from God, king, people to God is king, king is God. And now the people of Israel are doing the same thing. Even in India, the high caste of the Brahmins, a king can only come from that high caste. The Incas in South America were the kings were the delegates of the sun god. And among the Japanese, the emperors were descendants of the Shinto god. On and on we go throughout history. Now today we see, uh, you know, the kings and queens of Europe as, man, they're so wonderful, beautiful, doing philanthropy. That's not always the way. They had a God complex. Now I want to switch gears here for a moment. How does this all relate to the founding of America? I have a very short time, but I hope you will pay attention to this because in the seventh century with the coming of Islam, you know, Islam came, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, the prophet of Allah, and he began conquering the known world at the time around there. But then his followers, his caliphs, his successors, they were descendants of the prophet Muhammad. And their job, again, they were representing God, was to convert every person in sight to Islam. And so they began to move out from that part of Arabia to go to the north, to go to the west, to go to the east. And in a matter of 100 years, those caliphs, descendants of Muhammad, were capturing and conquering the known world. And they even made their way all the way up towards Tours. How many of you heard of the Battle of Tours? Remember that? We talked about that last week. Charles Martel, the hammer. He stopped them. There was a battle of Tours in, in AD uh, 732. And if that hadn't happened, Islam would have kept moving towards Europe. But these Islamic troops, they did something. They blocked off the trade from Mediterranean. So what happened to Europe? <laughs> 
The Arab troops, the Islamic troops control the trade route, so now you don't have all the things coming out of Egypt and North Africa and the Middle East, so you're stuck. And something happened to Europe. It has been sometimes people say, oh, this is happening in the world, America shouldn't get involved. Anytime somebody says that, I'm thinking, boy, you know, the fool shall be counted wise if he keeps his mouth shut. Sometimes it's better, don't speak. If you don't know, don't speak. Because they control the trade routes, the exporting of papyrus from Egypt was stopped. Now what do you do with papyrus? You make paper, you write on it. Now what happens, folks, if you can no longer export paper? You can't write. You can't read. And that was one of a critical reasons for the dark ages to come over Europe. We call them medieval times. Why were they dark? Because people can't read. They cannot. It's not like the world became dark. But when there's no education, there is no knowledge. Growth is stunted. And so uh, only in the monasteries where monks had education, where had understanding and they had enough you know, parchment and papyri to write that they could keep spreading education. If it wasn't for monasteries, Christianity would have died off in Europe. But the medieval times were born. Dark ages came. My time is running away. I want to fast forward. Fast forward through the Crusades to the rise of the Ottoman Empire and the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Once again, the Muslim army of the Ottomans, they are capturing, they're growing, they're becoming a massive empire. And they take over Constantinople. Constantinople was kind of like, a, a, like New York City. It was the heart of Christianity. And when Constantinople fell, when Byzantium fell, when Greece fell, listen, those scholars began to run. Those Greek scholars in Greece began to run, but they took their manuscripts with them. Manuscripts of Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and all the ancient art and, art and architecture. And they began to carry all that information and they went to a place called Florence, Italy. And people in Florence, Italy and neighboring areas began to look at these manuscripts and go, wow, I didn't know all this existed. And something was born. We call that, it starts with an R, Renaissance. The Renaissance age was born. All of a sudden people have knowledge, light is coming in. And at the heels of the Renaissance, another movement was born. It also starts with an R. This weekend, if you heard the podcast, we talked about it. It's called Reformation. You know when those Greek scholars ran? They didn't just take manuscripts of philosophers. They also took manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And they brought them with them. And scholars began to read them. And they go, we didn't know this existed. So the Bible was not originally in Latin, it was in Greek. We knew that, but we hadn't seen these copies. And there you have a man by the name of Martin Luther who nails those 95 theses to the wall, the door of Wittenberg. The Reformation is born. People are now able to get back to the sources. They're able to get back to the Bible as it was written. Now I want you to remember this because... This is where I really want you to pay attention. Even though Renaissance was going on, a lot of knowledge, a lot of excitement, even though Reformation was born and people were moving away, there was a break from the Roman Catholic Church, things were not good. What did the Ottomans do? They blocked off the trade routes. Remember what the, 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 the seventh century Muslim Arabs had done? They had blocked off the trade routes. Now the Ottomans did the same thing. And so Europe could not get the exports 
of things like spices from India, from China. We have to find ourselves another route. People often ask me, is Indian food spicy? I was like, I don't know, but you've always been looking for spices. I don't know what the problem is. All right? So we need to find another route because the Ottomans won't let us go through. And hence, someone named Columbus sailed, help me out, I'm not from here, sailed <laughs> the ocean blue in 1492. Is it making sense? And he thought he was going to find a way to the Far East, and he ended up where? Here. He was looking for a way to go around the Ottomans, and, and, and not just him, but many others, but it just wouldn't happen. And the Spanish Empire began to grow. This was the golden age for Spain, the most powerful empire in the world. But Ottoman Empire was also growing. The church was divided. You have Roman Catholics and you have Protestants now. But, but we have a threat. And what's the threat? The Ottomans. They keep coming. Now pay attention to this. In 1529, Suleiman the Magnificent, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, had his troops, had the Turks surrounding Vienna, Austria. I always find it amusing. People have a lot to say. They just don't know history. Did you know that? The Ottoman troops were surrounding Vienna, Austria. And other than the hand of God, I believe the providence of God in sending rain and sickness, he would have captured Austria, Vienna, and none of you would be here today. The world would look very different. Europe would look very different. They tried it in the 7th century, but again in this 16th century, the same thing happened. And Charles V of Spain, he knew something had to be done. So he said, we got to work with the Protestants. I know we don't get along. I know we have this problem of the Roman Catholics and Protestants. But if we're going to stand united against the Ottoman Turks, the Muslim invaders, we have to come together. And in 1555, he struck a deal with the Protestants, which is known as the Peace of Augsburg. How many of y'all are still with me? I want you to remember this because... This all ties into what happened in America in the founding. And I have to do this in eight minutes. Isn't that amazing? And the principle behind this piece is this. We have to come together. If not, we're going to fall apart. But the principle was this. Whose is the reign? His is the religion. I mean, you got Roman Catholics and you have Protestants. How can we make this work? Well, whoever rules that region... Everybody in the region has to follow his religion. Now, back up for a moment. Renaissance. What a great time. Michelangelo is painting this and Leonardo da Vinci is doing that. Oh, wonderful time. Reformation. The Bible is being translated into, in, into English. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, the Muslims are coming. We have to stand against them. We have to unite to fight against them, but wait, we still have a problem. The problem is this, whatever the king believes, that's what the people have to obey. So, if the king is Roman Catholic, you don't have a choice to be Protestant. You're going to be Roman Catholic. If the king is Protestant, you don't have a choice to do anything else but be Protestant because king is Protestant. In fact, King James I, you know you have the King James Bibles? He said it this way. He said, kings are God's lieutenants upon earth. They sit upon God's throne. The king is overlord of the whole land, master over every person having power over the life and death of everyone. You know, history is stranger than fiction. So sometimes we think about this, oh, wow, Reformation, Renaissance, Bible is translated. But, but if you were in England, you cannot worship any way you want to. You will follow the king's religion. 
So certain countries in Europe, based on the king's religion, were Roman Catholic. Italy, Spain, Portugal, Poland, German, Germany, because of Martin Luther's, they were, of course, many of them were Lutherans, but in certain parts when, where Lutheranism was not accepted, they were Roman Catholics. Netherlands, Dutch Reformed. Scotland, let's see how much history people know here. Which denomination would they go with in Scotland? Presbyterian. And how about in England? Anglican. Remember King Henry? Anglican. Now here's the thing. In 1555, this peace treaty was signed. And in 1558, in England, they passed a law known as the Act of Uniformity, according to which people had to attend the Anglican church once a week or be fined 12 pence. And if you were a peasant, if you were working in the fields or a farmer or whatever, I have to work because the king is demanding this or the rulers are demanding. You can't. You have to go or pay the fine. And the people could not afford that. And what if you believe that the church is flawed like the Puritans did? Well, then you will be persecuted. Isn't that amazing? The kingdom is Christian, and yet if you are a Puritan, you're not allowed here. There were people called the separatists who said, you know what, we're going to move ourselves out of the church. And the king said, but then you better move yourself out of my land. Because if you're going to be in this land, you're going to be an Anglican. And a group of them left England and went to the Netherlands because there was some freedom for the people there. But very quick, they, quickly they realized that the culture was very different. I mean, we care about our kids. Amen to that? We care about the influence on them. And if you don't, you need to. And these separatists who are living in Holland, they saw how their children were losing their way. And they said, we got to get out of here. We're hearing about this land across the ocean where we can worship according to our conscience. And so they got on these boats or these ships and they left and we call them pilgrims. Those are the pilgrims. And they came across the land and they sent word back and said, listen, we are far away from the king. We can worship according to our own conscience. Come on over. And people did. Again, my time is running away. At first, each colony began as a safe haven for certain denominations. So uh, if you were a Puritan, well, go to Massachusetts. If you were a Baptist, go to Rhode Island. So all you Baptists need to head to Rhode Island with Roger Williams, okay? Uh, if you were uh, a Congregational, Connecticut or New Hampshire. If you were Dutch Reformed, New York. If you were Quaker, like Quaker Oats, right? Head to Pennsylvania. Or Lutheran, you can head to Pennsylvania as well. How about if you were Anglican? Where do you go? We got Virginia. By the way, did you know that in the 18th century or 17th century, Baptists were persecuted across the border? It, right here in Virginia. In fact, Baptist ministers had their hands chopped off. It's, it's very interesting when people don't know history. Books were written to tell people Fight for your faith. There was a Baptist by the name of John Leland. If you're following the blog, it's not in the blog. John Leland was fighting to represent Virginia, the Continental Congress. And, and Madison met with him and said, if you let me fight for you, you go back and preach the gospel. I will represent your people. Madison was not a Baptist. He was an Anglican. And how about North Carolina and South Carolina? What, what, what was the denomination here? Anglican. Anglican. That's why a lot of people love the King James Bible around here. They don't even know why. Now, I like the manuscripts behind that. But that's a whole different 
disciplined as, oh, I'm the king James only. Yeah, it, because there were Anglicans here. And still to this day, you see the effects of that. How interesting it is. So now as the new nation is being born, when time came for the Revolutionary War, the big question was how can we be free? How can we be free not just as a people but also for our religious convictions? But well, we need democracy. But how in the world can you have democracy in such a big country? I mean, can you leave your farm? Can you leave your family every week and go vote? No. What you need is democratically elected constitutional republic. So this is what our founding fathers came up with. I don't know whatever reason you came with this morning. I hope you will pay attention to this. And talk to your children about this. We talk about sports and all kind of garbage. I love sports, don't get me wrong. And we don't take the time to teach them this. And all that will fade away with one injury. They need to be taught this. But in this system, who is the king? Not the representatives. Of course, God is the king, but in this system, the people are the king. Never in the history of the world has this ever been attempted when a group of people came together and said, we are going to be kings. And we will democratically elect a representative because we cannot leave our farms. We cannot travel hundreds of miles every week. And they will represent us, but in the confines of the Constitution. How amazing is that system? Israel did not have anything like that. They came close to this. Athens had democracy, but they were only city-states. But United States, how in the world can you get all these colonies to come together as these United States and work together? This is how we're going to do it. We're going to democratically uh, elect representatives who will represent us within the confines of the Constitution. And we will be one nation under, under God. Listen to this. Several of the leaders in the early American history, like Governor Morris said, the magistrate is not the king, the people are the king. John Jay, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court said, the people are the sovereign of this country. Thomas Jefferson, my favorite founding father, he said the ultimate arbiter is the people. Abraham Lincoln, now we're coming into the 19th century. He said, the people of these United States are the rightful masters of both Congresses and courts. Teddy Roosevelt, in the last century, in, he said, in no other place and at no other time has the experiment of government of the people, by the people, for the people, has been tried on so vast a scale as here in our own. Government for the people, by the people, and of the people. Does that sound familiar? How many of y'all know your Civil War history? Anybody here? Okay, you love Civil War? Who said that? Who said that? All the people, Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg, when he, when, I'm sorry, uh, when he went, uh, yes, Gettysburg address, he talked about the government of the people, for the people, by the people in a different order. But here's a question for those who just answered Abraham Lincoln. Where did Abraham Lincoln get it from? He got it from a man by the name of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was the man who translated the Bible, the first one to translate the Bible into English. Of course, it was from Latin, but he translated it into English. And in his prologue, he said this. Listen to this. He said, this Bible is for the government of the people, by the people, for the people. 
You know, this system doesn't work if you take God out. I find it very ironic The people with a little knowledge and two books and one YouTube video think they know better. <laughs> one professor in college who is really cool and funny and makes fun of Christians and all of a sudden you're sold. Folks, this system works because God is the ultimate king and people are the kings who elect representatives in a constitutional democracy. Now here's the question. In the Old Testament, the kings always had advisors, right? David had Nathan the prophet. All of them had some kind of counselor, some advisor who would advise the kings. Who is the advisor of these kings? Bill Federer suggested this, and I think it's beautiful. By the way, kings are not here, right? Everybody, everybody okay with that? Who are the kings? Oh, that was so poor. No wonder y'all are losing democracy. <laughs> Who are the king? Yeah. We are. The pastors are the counselors. Every church with every pastor, should be teaching their people unashamedly, without fear, what it means that this nation was founded on biblical values. Amen. Unless that begins to happen, people will always drag away into a side that is historically inaccurate. In America right now, there is something happening which is called deconstructionism, which is to wipe out the history of this nation. We can all say, yeah, yeah. do you really understand the history yourself? That's the real question. We can say, yes, it is happening, but do you know the true history? This is why it is so important for us to educate ourselves and go, I need to know before I tell you. And I hope you will take this message and talk to your children, your grandchildren, that this nation is one nation under God. I'm going to close with this verse, Psalm 33, verse 12. Psalm 33, verse 12, it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Of course, that prophecy or that promise was given to Israel first and foremost. But any nation, any people who would say, we want to be a nation under God, this promise applies to them that God will bless you. This morning, I don't know where you stand, but I hope, don't just listen to me. Go do your own research. Go study. Know how this nation was founded. Know the, the context in which the people who came here said, yes, we are in a Christian country, but we should be able to worship according to the dictates of our conscience. By the way, I'm only talking about Christian values, but also the freedom. Did you know in the, in the world of the kings, you cannot make a deal with someone. I cannot make a deal with you, and you cannot make a deal with me. Everything has to go through the king. The king has to give you a charter. The king of France... King Louis XIV, he said, I am like the sun and all my subjects revolve around me like planets. He said, why, you know why it's illegal? Because I said it's illegal. Imagine living in that world. And for the past two years, you know, I've got to do this. In the past two years, we have very quickly said, we will give our crown to you. You tell us how to live. And then a few of us had the audacity to stand up and challenge that. Some of our own who don't know their history said, oh, no, no, no. And sometimes you have to give over your right to somebody else. I hope this morning your eyes are open. Because our founding fathers, by God's grace, put together a system that has worked so long. And if it's going to keep working for your children and your grandchildren, you have to stand for biblical values. I'm not saying all politicians on either side are perfect or whatever. I'm not saying that. But we have to fight for this. If not, we will lose it. 
and more than anything, even more important than going to the ballot is to bring Christ as the king in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. You do that, everything else will work out. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord means King. Today's the day, give your heart to Him, be saved. And share that gospel with your children, your neighbors, your friends, your enemies, so that Christ can be the ruler of their hearts. And then pray for our nation. People talk about keeping those two things separate. It was never meant to be separate. It's a system that our founding fathers prayerfully put together so that we can enjoy the many freedoms we have.